Good morning, church family. Uh, we're so grateful and, and honored that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. And I, and I do use those words um, intentionally because you have chosen to worship, not just to go to church or not just to get your name checked off on a roll or not just to be able to receive some pat on the back, but you have chosen to truly worship, which means uh, opening your heart up and being able to stand before God and give what's on the inside of you back to God. So we're grateful and thankful for you today. And we want to be able to get into this text today because I know it's Super Bowl Sunday and we want to make sure that everybody has is, is, is got their barbecue ready. You got your hot wings ready and everybody's ready to go. Uh, some of you guys are rooting for the Chiefs. Some of you guys are rooting for Tampa Bay. But uh, I'll tell you today, the, the one thing that I want to make sure that we do is make sure that we continue to root for ourselves and root for Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I promise that the Super Bowl comes on at 530. Super Bowl comes on at 530. That means I'm going to get through with this message as soon as possible. And based on my notes here, I can have us out of here by 525. Give us five minutes to spare before the kickoff. All right. Amen. Amen. But we want to move right into this thing this morning. If you would, if you would bow with me this morning as we all ask God to come into this place this morning, let us bow. Eternal God, we come to you today saying thank you for your, your grace. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you, God, for this first Sunday of the month. And we pray that you will continue to bless us, God. Bless this word that it goes forth, God, that it may fall on good ground, that we may hear your word, God, but not only be hearers of the word, God, but we'll be doers of your word. Remove me out of the way, God, so that your people may hear your voice and be able to hear you speaking to them. We thank you in advance, God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen, amen, amen. All right, let's let, let's jump into this thing this morning. There's a lot I want to cover. Uh, but this being first Sunday, I, I don't want to labor the time. I don't want to labor the moment. But let's get right into it. Let's let's recap where we were last week. Last week we talked about uh, the principle of fasting, and it was really good because we talked about with the acronym IHOP. I-H-O-P. We talked about that acronym. And what I want us to remember from that is, is that if you really want to change, that's what we talked about, changing. If you really want to change, then you have to be intentional when you fast. Be intentional. That was the I. The other thing is this. If you want God to move, if you want God to start moving in your life, then you have to be humble when you fast. You have to be humble. And the next thing was, is to increase your spiritual capacity to be able to receive more of what God has in store for you. When we, when we have the keys of the kingdom and we start unlocking these doors and we want more, the one thing that we have to do is we have to be open-minded. We have to be open-minded, which calls us to be expected, to expect those things that we call and expect those things that we pray for. And the last thing is in order to break habits and break spiritual bondage and break and pull down strongholds that we have to be persistent in our prayer and in our fasting. That was very key. That's, that was that was the principle of fasting. And I want to continue to harp on this because when we're talking about the keys of the kingdom, it must be understood and we must be very clear that God wants a relationship God does not want a religion and, and, and the kingdom of God is in your heart and that's what he wants. And that's what this text continues to, to show us and continues to reveal to us every week. We need keys that will unlock the power of the kingdom. And keys give you instant access to everything the key opens. And the secret though, the secret though is this. It's knowing what the key opens. The keys of the kingdom give us immediate access to all the resources of heaven. And for the past three weeks, what I've been trying to unlock and what God has been trying to get us to see is that we have to develop a kingdom mindset that will change our perspective on Christian living. Amen. Amen. So walk with me this morning. Uh, let's look at Matthew 6. We're still in Matthew 6. And I want to read these verses as a reference point. We have uh, as some other scriptures that we will deal with this morning. And I want to say that ahead of time. Uh, but I want to read these scriptures as a reference point for us to launch so God can truly explore and expose this text to us today. The first verse reads, be careful not to practice your righteousness 
in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. So when you give, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with the trumpets that the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, in secret. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And I want to also read verse 24. I'm going to give you time. Scroll through it in your phone or in your Bible. Verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. So to, 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 today, this morning, we want to talk about the principle of giving. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I see people uh, rolling their eyes already. Because whenever we talk about money or whenever money comes up, everyone gets defensive. Everyone gets defensive. And, and the reason is, is because we feel like God is the giver. But the question always comes in our mind, why should we give our money to God? If God is this ultimate giver. I'm reminded of the story about uh, uh, soldiers during the crusades. And, and when they would fight, before they would go out to battle, they would go down to the river and, and the priest would, would, would baptize the soldiers in the water. And when they would baptize the soldiers in the water, the soldiers would hold their swords above their heads and they would get baptized and everything their body and everything else would get baptized into the water to show that they're surrendering all that they have to God. But the one thing that did not go under the water was their swords because they wanted to have control over their swords to be able to kill and be able to work for them the way they wanted to. How many of you know that's exactly the way we are as Christians today? We're the exact same way. We want God to have control over everything in our life, everything, every facet of our life, except our wallet. We'll get baptized and get slain in, in the spirit. But guess what? We'll still come back and we want control over our finances because we don't want to surrender our finances over to God. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns us uh, against this because and this is important and I need us to see this today. Because uh, he warns us against heart sins. Jesus is, is talking about those things that are of the law, but he says, I did not come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill the law. So everything that Jesus talks about, he's making us understand from a kingdom perspective how we should take it to the next level. OK, and so he says this, he says uh, this is. He talks about a heart adultery. In Matthew 5, 28, he says, I say unto you that whatsoever, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery where? In his heart. He said the same thing about a heart murder. Doing what we do from an inward place is vital so that we are approved by God. That's what our text is talking to us about. He's talking about giving in secret, not letting everybody know what's going on because it puts our heart in the right place. Our heart now has the right posture to be able to give. How many of you know your heart has to be in the right place before you can give anything? Amen, amen, amen. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another one withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. Wow. I want to talk about three things today and I'm going to let you have it. You can go watch your kickoff. You can watch the Super Bowl and do what you want to do. Three questions that I have for you today. And I want to answer these questions to us because we're going to really, really open this thing up and be able to dive in and understand what God means when he wants us to give in the kingdom. The first question is, is when to give? When should we give? And I, I want you to understand that it doesn't just talk. Jesus is not just talking, about it, but God also talked about this. Even before the law was given to Moses, it talked about giving all the way back in the book of Genesis. Genesis four and three. 
If you don't mind, I'd like to read there for you. You don't have to read it. I'll read it for you. Because this is a text that was always a little confusing to me. Because in this text, both Cain and Abel gave an offering. But when I was younger, I never understood why God accepted Abel's offering and not Cain's offering. But over time and after studying it and after uh, um, being uh, indoctrinated in this understanding of giving, I, I understood it better. And I want us to understand it better today because some of us are still confused when it comes to giving. Genesis 4 and 3 says, in the course of time, key right there, look at that. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering of fat portions, the good part, from some of his firstborn of his flock. Okay, so we got to see that. It's, he says, in the course of time. That means that Cain took his time, and, and, and Cain took his time when he wanted to give his offering to God. Time. Okay, in the course of time, which means he got all of his offering together and he put on this side what he wanted to keep. He, he picked around it and, 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 and he put his side, he put his fruits over here, and then he put a basket together. And decided when he got ready, he was going to give it to God. But Abel gave of his firstborn. So when should we give? We should give first. I stopped by also to let us know and understand this morning that not every offering given pleases God. Mm, somebody need to hear that this morning. That may be enough for you right there that you might be able to, to, to change everything that's going on in your life right now. Just by understanding that not Every offering given pleases God because God wants you to give it when you first get it. Oh, I'm, I'm about to go deeper into this thing right now. And I need you guys to go with me. This is why it's so important when we talk about Matthew 6, that we should seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seeking God first, which means God can never be second in your life. God does will never be second in your life. So everything that we give to God, we should give to God first because he is first and he is the priority in your life. And when God is first, in your life, all things align in your life. Amen. Amen. I want to take that a little. I want to take that a step further. Exodus 13 verses one through two. I want to read this to you. Then I'm going to read 12 through 13 because this is going to help us understand when to give. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me. That means I want you to set apart for me. I want you to dedicate to me. I want you to be able to give to me. Every firstborn male, the first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to who? It belongs to me, whether human or animal. Then verse 12 says, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring. I'm talking about, we're still talking about first, talking about the principle of first right now. Every offspring, every first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. And I know I just lost a lot of you because, you, you know, everybody, some of us don't even read uh, the old Teddy anymore. Old Teddy, that's, that's the Old Testament. I put a slang word on there for y'all. Come on, walk with me. All right. But let's ooh, let's really dive into this thing because God has something he wants to reveal to us today. Watch this. He says, there is a requirement of your first. That's what God is saying in his text. He talked to the children of Israel after he had brought them out of Egypt. He told them now, this is what I want you to do when you give. And when you give your offering is that there is a requirement of your first. And there is a requirement of your first because your first, he said, is mine. Your first belongs to God. Oh, man. This is about to blow your mind right here because it takes faith to give your first. It takes faith to give your first. God doesn't want your sloppy seconds. God doesn't want the things that are picked over. God doesn't want the leftovers. But he's saying 
I want your first because your first that you have truly belongs to me. Ask any woman that you've ever dated or ask your wife. No woman wants to be chosen second. Come on. Come on. Let me talk. To, let me walk in your living room right now. But every woman wants to be first in your life. And because you guys are in a relationship. Remember, we're not talking about a religion, but being in a relationship, you have to put that person first and give that person what's required first. Oh, man. The next thing is this. There is redemption in your first. And this is where I want us to break this down. There is redemption in in your first. Because this is what the text says. It says, we ought to give the, the first of our clean animals. The first of the clean animal shall be sacrificed. Okay? You walk it with me. The first of the unclean animal shall be redeemed. And it can only be redeemed by a clean animal. That's why he gives us an example of the lamb and the donkey, the lamb being a clean animal and a donkey being an unclean animal, which basically means that for every donkey that is born, a lamb has to be sacrificed. But then he takes it a step further and says, all of your sons have to be redeemed. And why would God say that? Because here's what I want you to Here's what I want you to see, that we are all born in a sinful nature. Can we all agree on that? It's, it's, it's easier to do bad and it's easier to do wrong than it is to be good because we're all born in a sinful nature and we're born unclean. Oh, somebody walking with me right now. Somebody ready to shout right now because you know where I'm going with this thing. And if we are unclean, if we are unclean, then that means that there has to be a lamb that takes the place of our unclean and our uncleanliness, that a lamb has to be sacrificed for us to be able to survive. Because if a lamb is not sacrificed, it said, then, then you must break that donkey's neck. So that means this. Jesus was born clean. Mm. And something clean had to be sacrificed for something unclean. We were unclean, which is why God gave his first in Jesus to redeem us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody ought to say hallelujah right there. That while we were yet sinners, woo, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's why we call him our redeemer. That's why the scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's why he's called the precious lamb of God because he did his redemptive work on Calvary's cross. Oh, somebody ought to feel me this morning. Somebody ought to understand it. And that's why it's required of us to give our first. And that's why God was trying to tell the children of Israel that you ought to give your first because you remember. Oh, I remember what he did for me back on Calvary and that's why my heart is the way it is and that's why I don't mind giving God my first because I remember what he did for me way back on Calvary when he hung, bled and died and he stretched his arms out wide oh my God, my God, my God that's why mm, I can give my first and it belongs to him because I remember what he did for me oh I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm getting ahead of myself Uh Second point is this, what to give? How do we know what to give? Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits. First again, the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Think about this. He's telling us right now that, that we ought to give the first fruits. And, and when he talks about giving here, he's really talking about a tithe and he's talking about a tithe being a tenth. How many of you know today that Jesus was God's tithe? How many of you know that, that God gave his first? John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't wait to give us his sloppy seconds, but he gave us his only begotten son. 
Oh, and I stop by to tell you, if you don't remember anything that I said this morning, remember this, that we are most like God when we're giving. I'm going to say that one more time for somebody so it can drop down in your spirit this morning. We are most like God when we are giving. Because that's what God did. He gave his only begotten son. Oh, let me break it down a little bit further because I think Malachi really opens it up and gives us an understanding of, of what to give. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Whose house? His house. Then he says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough to store it. Can I break that text down to us this morning? Let's, let's look at it like this. He says, bring. Remember, we talked about the first that 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 tie the, is required unto God. He didn't say give it right here because you can't give something that doesn't belong to you. That's why he says bring everything that you own belongs to God or everything that you think you own belongs to God. See, here's the problem that we have today as Christians. And I, and I want us truly to get this today. The problem that you have is that you think you are the source of your prosperity. You think you are the reason that you call it. That's my check. That's my bank account. That's that's my income. That's my money in my wallet. That's my money that I put into my bosom. Mm. You think it belongs to you. And if we give a tithe, the tithe, that's our 10 percent of our income. What God is saying to us is, is that you ought to give your first 10 percent. That means if you're giving or if you made a thousand dollars and you got 10 one hundred dollar bills, God says, I want the first one hundred dollar bill. I don't want the ninth or the tenth or you you wait to pay your light bill or wait to pay. Uh, come on, preacher. You're going to wait to pay your rent. But no, I want it off the top. That means as soon as you get paid, you want to give what belongs to God to God. That's why he says, bring it the whole tide into the storehouse. The whole tide. The whole tide. The whole time. It wasn't that they weren't giving anything to God. And it's not that we don't give anything to God. But it's the fact that we don't bring it all to God. See, we want to just bring something that, that we want to give. We got that Cain syndrome. We want to bring something that we want to give so we can be checked out. We want to give and so everybody can see that we're doing something and that, and that we're doing just enough. But what I stopped by to tell you today is that Malachi says, will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? And I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, if somebody said that I was robbing them or somebody called me a thief, and you know, my mama taught me that, that, that that's kind of disrespectful. That, that's almost fighting words. If, but because I had the integrity in my heart and I was taught never to steal. But God is saying here is that if we're not bringing it all to him, then we're robbing him. And I don't want to rob, let alone rob somebody else. I definitely don't want to rob God. So what I want us to see here is this, is that when we tithe and when we give to God and when we bring those tithes into the storehouse, it is an investment in yourself. Come on. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. Somebody ought to clap your hands because you know what I'm saying is true. It is an investment to yourself and to the kingdom. Think about it. We truly gave our all to the kingdom, how we can be able to end poverty right now. If you don't believe me, look at the text. He says, test me in this. That means test me and see and, and, and watch what I'll do. He said, I'll open up a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing. But the reality of it is, like, like, like uh, it said in Luke 16, is that you can't begin to trust God in more serious matters, like healing or, or deliverance or, or, or peace, if you can't even be trusted with handling money or handling wealth. Who's going to trust you with the true riches? Oh, come on. Come on. Your money and stewardship over money reveals your true faith in God. Oh, somebody needs to hear that today. Because your, your, who you are is truly shown by where you spend your time and where you spend your money. Who you are, your identity, your character is truly shown in where you spend your time and where you spend your money. 
I know I won't get a lot of amens, but that's all right, because I want us to truly understand what the scripture is trying to tell us this morning. Money has something to do with authenticating your trust in God. Money has something to do with authenticating your trust in God. Understand this. God is not upset or disappointed that you're not giving your little $150 or you're not giving your $200. God is upset and talks about you robbing him because you don't have faith. You don't have faith enough to believe that he will provide. That's what he's talking about in, in, in the text when he goes on and in verse 25 of Matthew 6, where he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life or what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear. He said, look at the birds. They sow not, neither do they reap. But your father feedeth them. And he said, if, the, if your father feedeth the birds, huh, come on somebody, you don't think that he's going to feed you? But I, I want you to see that. And I want you to ask yourself, are you a giver? Because if you're not a giver, then you don't really trust God. Are you a tither? Because if you don't, then if you don't tithe, then you really don't trust God. Let me break it down for you like this, and I'm, I'm about to get out your hair. Think about this. We've all been to Papa Do's and Paris Steakhouse, and we go to the restaurant, and the waitress comes, and we have great service. Waitress come, they keep your drinks filled up, ask you whatever you need. And because they give good service, <laughs> come on, somebody walking with me already. And because they give good service, at the time, they bring us the bill. And when they bring us the bill, it shows you what you're required to pay. But because you've had good service, you want to give a tip. And sometimes, right now, I think the uh, average tip is about 15%. percent mm above 10%. And because they're giving good service, a lot of times you'll tip them even more just for giving you good service at Papa Do's. And you trying to tell me the God that we serve isn't better than the shrimp that you were eating? Your life is not more important than the lobster or the steak that you were eating? And it's not more important than the man of God who pours into your heart every single day and you got a problem with giving 10%? We got a problem because if it's truly about the, the kingdom, then it shouldn't be just what we give. The, the tithe should be the minimum. You give that waitress more than you give God, and we ought to be ashamed of ourselves because at that moment, we're giving out of our heart. But when it comes to giving to the kingdom, we want to get stingy with our pockets. And I'm just trying to tell you today how to be blessed today. Oh, that's what I'm trying to tell you, how to be blessed. Your giving is required. Your giving requires your obedience. And also when you're giving, giving is contagious. So you, you'll teach your kids how to give. You'll teach everybody around you how to give. And you'll leave a legacy of givers. Oh, but in this world today, we, well, we got some stingy folk today. And Jesus talks about it even in Luke uh, 1142. He talks about the tent. He told the Pharisees, he said, because you give your tenth of your mint and the root and in the gardens of uh, your herbs, that means he told them that, yes, that's required. But he says, neglect not the justice and the love, which means our hearts, we ought to go further than just that. Because that's what he wants us to do when we have a kingdom perspective is go beyond what we think is the call of duty. Which leads us to our last point is that how should I give? How should I give? He says money is important. It's so important that he goes into verse 24 and says, you can't serve two masters. And he talks about this because he said, you can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. And then he says, you can't love both God and money. And you have to give with a committed heart. That's how we ought to give. We ought to give with a committed heart. Our giving should be a reflection of our heart's treasures. Oh, that's why he says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Come on, finish it up. Also, our giving should be a natural response to God's gracious gift to mankind. What I'm trying to tell you is today is that money is to be given not to hold and to build bigger bonds. But, but Jesus talks about money and possessions more than he talks about prayer and more than he talks about faith because he understands that money has the potential 
uh, the potential of becoming your master. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Money has the potential of becoming your master. And you can't trust money, but you must trust in the kingdom. Because money will make you do things that, that you wouldn't normally do for God. The song says, for the love of money, people will steal from their mother. For the love of money, people will rob their own brother. That's why I, what I'm trying to tell you that money and the love of money becomes the root of all evil, which is why Jesus, uh, he, he helps us to refrain from it. Money will make you get up early in the morning and, and, and get to work at 530 and you won't dare set your alarm at 530 for prayer. Come on. Money will make you give your time. Money, we, we think all day about how we can get more money. We take on extra jobs. Money will make you smile. Money will make you cry. Money will make you depressed. Money will make you shout. But, but, but the problem is, is that the attachment and the affection for money, we don't want to let it go. And that's why we can't give to the kingdom. That's why our relationship is so rocky with God. That's why we can't truly be blessed because we don't want to be able to give to the kingdom because we think it all belongs to us. But, but when you give, it's worship. Come on. When you start to really give, you understand that it's worship going on. When you get down on your knees and you pray, that's worship. But when you give also, that's your worship to God because you give what's on the inside. And, and you understand that when you come before the king, uh, you ought to bring a gift. Come on, somebody. When you come before the king, you ought to bring a gift. And, and, and what can you, what kind of gift can you bring to a king that already has everything? The only thing that you can give is your heart. Oh, the only thing that you can give is your heart. And God wants your heart today. He wants you to be able to give in faith. So today I want you to make up in your mind today that I, I want you to put your name in the blank today. I, Dallas, I will not allow money to be my master. When I think about money trying to take over and take the place of God, I'll give. You want to stop money from controlling your life? Then just give it. Come on, just give it. And when you give it, I want to give it in faith because I know who my master is. And money can never be my master if I'm giving to the kingdom. So what I stopped by to tell you today, and I'm taking my seat, is that we ought to praise God for his undesirable gift. The greatest gift that was ever given to mankind. The gift that keeps on giving. The gift that went to the cross. The gift that went down in the grave. The gift that got up from the grave with all power in his hands. That was God's worship to us. That he gave his only begotten son. That was God's worship to us. So today I want us to truly understand. That if we really want to give to God, that God wants your heart and he wants you to give from your heart. Don't be like the hypocrites going out shouting, telling people what you've done, but you ought to give it because it's in your heart. And that's when we'll truly be able to see the windows of heaven pour out blessings on your life. It's not a give and get type thing. It's a, it's a faith thing because it's the trusting of your faith. God wants to see that you trust him enough. Do you trust God enough to give? Do you trust God enough to give from your heart? Do you trust God today? Do you trust God today? Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. But God says, if you're giving with the right heart, then he'll take care of you. If you seek ye first the kingdom, and all of his righteousness, he will take care of you. He that had ears to hear, let him hear today. The doors of the church are open.